and the Lord has given me a more excellent way. We've been talking about a more excellent way, a teaching on the spiritual roots of diseases. We're going to be talking about a lot of diseases and how to get rid of a lot of things and how we can stop these things. One of the things that, that helps us a lot is what you call preventive maintenance. Prevent, pre preventive maintenance is preventing something before it really get a hold on you. Amen? In other words, if I see uh, someone with a nasty cold by me, and if I can say, you know what, this person by me, this cold is very contagious. And I know it's just a matter of time. It may even come and circulate within the atmosphere. So what I'm going to do, because that contagious person is around me, I'm going to make sure that I can uh, something right now to help my body to become strengthened that I don't have to wait till the till the to get a hold on me. Amen. I think what we do a lot of times we begin to get a few little things that begin to give us a warning. We get the little warning signs. We start finding the little snickles and snuff and snuffing up and and all of that. We say, you know, uh, you know, it seems like I'm trying to get a cold. Or you start coughing and all of that, and you know something is trying to get a hold on you. Always the signs comes before the danger. Amen. The sign comes on first. The Lord always warns us before the danger occur. Amen. Give us warning signs. And when you start seeing the warning signs and you begin to see the little things start trying to uh, circulate, you know, the little coughing and sneezing and nose running, you say, wait a minute. The enemy trying to bring a cold on me. I'm going to take me something right now. I'm going to take me something now, uh, something like a decongestion to, to stop congestion from selling in. You start trying to take something. That's what you call preventive maintenance. Prevent it before it get a hold on you because uh, everything that comes on you, colds and sickness and diseases, they always some warning signs comes first. And if we can jump and, and, and respect those warning signs and say, you know what, I'm not going to let it get a hold on me. I'm going to do something right now. Believe me, it won't get a hold on you. Amen? Amen. So that's what you call preventive maintenance and also disease prevention. Now, the word of God says, and there are some teachings that the Lord also gives us. And he says to us in Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he get old, he will not depart from it. So training them up, just like when you train somebody to trust and to depend on the word, you trust somebody and you train them to, to, to understand that when danger comes in your life, call on the Lord. Know the Lord is more than able. We need to, as, as, as parents and as Christians, we need to teach our children and our grandchildren about the goodness of the Lord. We need, we need to let them know how powerful the Lord is. You know, I wish I, I w it would have been good if my parents would have knew about the power of the Lord before I got to be an adult. It's a whole lot of things would have never really been able to get a hold on me. If they would have taught me, if you're sick, the word of God says, you know, just trust in the Lord. And the Lord was wounded for your transgression, boost for my iniquities. The chest of my peace was upon by his stripes. I'm healed. Believe me, a whole lot of things would never been able to uh, come my way while I was young and foolish and now unaware. But uh, if I train them up in the way they would go when they're young, when they get old, it's coming, they're coming back to it. And uh, they, would, you know, they would not depart from it. They're going to come back to it. Amen. Amen. So I know that even if, if they get away from the Lord, uh, training them up, they get away. They may go out there and get their head bumped sometimes, but eventually they're going to come back. Because that word of God is rooted and get grounded in you. It's there. And when trouble comes, they know who to call. I remember a while back I was, um, I was, I was working on the railroad years ago. And uh, they had put me in an area pretty dark. Uh, they had put me out there uh, in what you call off Cook's Road over there in Lumberton. And I was over there around about 12 o'clock that night. They told me to stay over there on the side of the road. And when, when a train comes by, to observe that train because they heard that the train had hot wheels on it. And one of the wheels has supposed to gotten hot. And I need to inspect it. Look at it to make sure that if the wheels are hot, give them warnings that they can stop it while it's en route so it won't pass the city of Beaumont 
and go to another area and could be a danger to be lives. So I had to go on Crooks Road out there in Lumberton, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm just out there, man, in dark, darkness, and every once in a while a car passed by, I didn't know if it was a person that may be devising evil or whatever. I just didn't know. That's a bad feeling because in those times, you know, Lumberton was considered a pretty bad area. That was an area that we was not, as black men and women, we were found. We, we tried to stay away from those areas. There was somebody that could like a vida, you know. So uh, what happened is that I stayed around there and I said, Lord, I said, you know, I, I really, I, I, had, I had gotten saved, but I didn't know where to go to get the word that I needed. But then I remember the passage from the 23rd number of Psalms. And I began to quote, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He making me to lie down in green pastures. He leading me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Thou prepares a table for me, present in thine enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil. My cup running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall find me all the days of my life, for I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I kept on repeating, I kept on repeating. Eventually the train came. I noticed it, I analyzed it, I inspected it, and quick as I did, I got back in my truck and I was able to come back to the city. I said, Lord, I want to thank you because all that, uh, that passage, I remember reading it years ago when I had just gotten converted. But at this time, I needed that word. I just needed a word of comfort and consolation from the Lord. I need something that I was able to hold on to. I need something that I can grasp. And, and I reminded the Lord, Lord, you are my shepherd. And I shall not want. You making me to lie down in green pastures. You leading me beside the still waters. You restored my soul. You lead me in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valleys of shadows of death. I feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff that comfort me. Thou prepares a table for me, present in my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil, my cup running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. For I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, you got to be able to go back to some of that that you received it and some of that was in your belly. That's why the Lord says, if you are his, say at that hour of temptation, he will give you the words to say. You just open your mouth and he will tell you what to say because there's going to be some times in our lives that we just need a word from the Lord. But if it's been implanted in within you, if it's been received in you, it's supposed to be able to come out of you. Amen. So I was able to go back and pick that word up and bring it back because I needed that word right now. I needed that strength right now. I needed something I could hold on to. And that's why I say train that child up and the way he would go when he's young. When he get old, he's not going to depart from it. That means he's going to come back to him. It's always there. He can go back and pick it up. See, when you got that word in you, when you're going in trouble, when sickness or disease try to come your way, you can always pick that word up and bring it with you. That's why he said, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy is that word. Goodness and mercy is his grace. Goodness and mercy is that faith and trusting, believing in him. It's going to follow you all the days of your life. It's going to be around you. It's just waiting on you to just pick him up and go on with your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And then he says, the end came the Lord want to heal all our diseases. And Psalms 103 verse 3 says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Amen. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. See, before he healed us, we got to be forgiving. In other words, it let us know that if you got any sickness that come on you, but if you have not forgiven your brother their trespasses, the healing is not going to come to you because everything is line on line, precept on precept. Everything has its weight. The Lord said even before, he said, if you have all against your brother, before you even come to me and ask me to, 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 to forgive you, you got to first forgive your brother. Amen. You got to first forgive him. You got to get everything in order. See, we think that we can still hold malice and unforgiveness in us. And then when sickness come our way, we can ask the Lord to heal us and the Lord's going to heal us. No, the Lord cannot go beyond his word. 
He hearkened his word to perform it. That means the Lord listened for his word. The Lord said, wait a minute, that's an art. Because the accuser of the brethren have came and accused you before me to say that you did this against your sister or against your brother. And so even when you want me to bless you, I cannot bless you because I cannot bless no mess. Amen. So you got to get all that read. So it says, who forgive it all thine iniquities. He's going to forgive you all your iniquities when you bring him to him, ask him to forgive you. But in turn, we got to forgive our brother his trespasses against us. And then he says, who heal it. If you notice, there is a quotation uh, right behind iniquities, which means continuation. See, sometimes we want a period. That means we can stop right there. But we got to go on further. Anytime that quotation comes, that means pause for just a second. But don't stop me yet. Got to pause. You got to say, you know, Lord, if there's any heart against any man or woman that's within my heart, because I need a healing. I ask your forgiveness that I can get that out of the way. And then he says, who healed all our diseases. Amen. He want to heal all our diseases. But everything has to be line on line, precept on precept. Amen. 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 Now, over the years, God has shown many insights into why mankind has diseases. It is not that God cannot heal you. Or that he doesn't want to. The problem is that man does not understand diseases. We need to understand what disease is about. Now the Lord emphasized in Isaiah 5 and 13 and 14. Therefore my people are going into captivity because they have no knowledge. They have been grabbed into captivity because they just don't know any better. See when the enemy can, can put us in captivity... It's when we are lack and we are not aware because we just don't know. But he says, my people are going into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. In their glory, in their multitude, in their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. In other words, he's letting us know that hell has enlarged itself because Lord people are perishing for lack of knowledge. Now, what are they lack of knowledge? The word of God. See, a lot of people, many of us, when we were out word, we may have been received of, 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 of religion. You can get religion, but no word. See, we need the word. See, I need a word from the Lord. See, I don't need no religion. See, it's too many religious folks. They can be so religious, you jumping up and screaming and hollering and shouting about what? You're doing it because everybody else is doing it. You're doing it because it's customary. You're doing it because, you know, it just makes you feel good. But feel good is not going to get you delivered. The thing that gets you delivered is when you can hear that word and say, thank you, Lord. See, it's so many things we miss in life because we just didn't know any better. So many things that the devil had privy over us because we didn't know better. The Lord says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They perish because they just don't know any better. And I just feel sorry for them because they just don't know. So much has been offered to us. Let me tell you something. I've been in church for 30 some years and didn't know Jesus. Didn't know I was hearing a religion. I was jumping up, shouting, screaming and hollering. Like everybody else, feeling good, going to church, smiling and laughing, see the preacher preach, didn't know what he was talking about. But one day, somebody introduced me to Jesus. See, you can, see, you can be in church and don't know nothing about Jesus. Because I heard about a man dying for me, but I didn't know why he died. I didn't know why it was so vital and important for me to receive him. Because it was never told about who he really was and who he truly is. I heard about, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, I read, I remember all the, all the old patriots. I remember even a few times we went into the New Testament and they talked about this man named Jesus. But when it really got to it, they would tell me about this man died on the cross. I said, well, what is so, what is so important about dying on the cross? What is that to me? I heard about how this man was doing nothing but good, but how is that to me? But when I heard about it, that he was 
hung on the cross. And I heard that his body was received of 39 stripes, minus one for all my sickness and diseases. When I heard that, that we can just believe, we can ask of him anything, he would do it. That his desires is that we not perish. His desires that we have life and have it abundantly. When I heard about he's a healer and he's healing his people. When I heard that he's a deliverer and he's delivering his people. When I heard that he's a savior and he's saving his people from their sins. I said, I need to know about this man. I want to know more about this man. I want to know what's so good about this man. And I'm hearing all of this good stuff. But see, I waited for a long time. But I had to kind of go around until I find that word. I had to realize where I was at. I just wasn't getting it. I had a good man. I had a man that, that, you know, that was every, that every Sunday morning. But I wasn't feeding. My soul wasn't being fed. I was walking in darkness. I remember one day the man told me, as I had been there, I was 16 years old, and told me, he said, you know what you ever thought about being baptized? I said, no. I said, he said, well, you need to be baptized. I said, well, I'm ready to get baptized. And I remember I went in that water, a dry devil, and I came out a wet devil. Ain't nothing changed in me. I mean, I done that because he asked me to do it. I didn't realize what I was getting baptized for. All I knew was I was going in the water. Man, I consider it a good thing. I'm going, I'm getting ready to get, go in the water. I'm getting ready to, you know, kind of take me a little swim or whatever, you know, and all of that. But I didn't realize what is symbolic. You know, what was the symbolicness of being baptized? I didn't realize it for the washing of my sins, it was just a, just a, a, a pre-emphasis for where I was getting ready to go. I didn't realize it was the old man being washed away and a new man coming alive again. See, I didn't know that because it wasn't explained to me. So we can go to church and go to hell in the church. Or we can sit back and say, you know what? I need a word. I need a word from the Lord. I need to know about Jesus. See, I don't want to know about it. You know, it's good to know all these stories that we hear. It's good to hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's a good thing. But we need to know about Jesus. And see, when I start hearing about Jesus, see, uh, people need to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because everything was done Everything was gained on the cross. And when I heard about a cross preaching, instead of somebody being nailed to a cross for what? What is that? But when I find out the reason why, and when I heard about all the things that was accomplished when he was nailed to that cross, I said, I need that man in my life. I want to accept him. I want him to be my Lord. I want him to be my God. But see, I had to find somebody that would tell me the truth. I had to find somebody that was not trying to go and build a church. I was trying to find somebody who was not just trying to make me inform in formality. See, I need to get away from that. But I needed the real man. I needed the real thing. Amen. When you get the real thing, you can't be satisfied with nothing else. Amen. I mean, I done got some watered down stuff. I done, I done got some stuff that's, you know, but, but when you get the pure stuff, unadulterated word. When you get that word and it's not watered down, give me the sincere mick of the word. I want the real word. I want that word that, no, that, that, that's going to get me straight. Because the Lord is not going to be it. Uh, of, uh, no, uh, no word, just excuse my uh, foolishness. He said, my people are perishing for lack of knowledge. They just don't know. Nobody tell them. But I was in teachers. That would tell them, thus said the Lord. You know the reason why the Lord sent many prophets to the world? Because the leaders in those times, the religious leaders, wasn't knowledgeable to who he is. But the Lord sent men and women of God that, that was really out there in the wilderness and, and going through things. And people that, you know, that, that had experiences and, and who had experience with the Lord. And the Lord sent prophets over to the areas to feed the people. And that's why you got the, the, the word of God is built on the laws and the prophets. Amen. So the prophets, they had all kind of prophets. And you read about the prophets. All of them wasn't uh, like Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, and, and Daniel. All of them wasn't no major prophets. You had a lot of minor prophets. They're people that just had a very small part to do. But yet and still, it was so vital to the kingdom that the Lord wanted it to be inscribed in his word. When you think about somebody like Nehemiah, I talk about Nehemiah all the time. All he was was the, what was the, was the king's uh, wine taster. That's all he did, taste the wine. Make sure that the king would not have any poison wine 
That's all he did. And one day he heard about over there in the homeland, it was going to destruction. He asked the king, king, can you permit me to go home and, and get some things straight because the, the gates are burned down and the, and the walls are broken and, and I just want to go back home and straighten out some stuff. And, and the king says, well, what is that to me? He said, well, dear king, you know, I'm very much concerned about homeland and I just need to go and straighten some things out. And the king gave him the liberty and he was governor. Why? Because he had liberty to go all around the king side, the kingdom, and just tell everybody, this is a letter from the king. Stay that. Give me all the timber I need. Give me the wood that I need. Give me all the stuff that I need. Give me all the nails that I need. Give me all the iron that I need. In other words, he just had a letter from the king. The king said, how long are you going to be? He said, I don't know, dear king, but quick as I get through in so many words, paraphrasing, I'll be right back. 52 days, the walls was built back. Why? The Lord put that in the word of God. Because the Lord showed there still got to be concerns from us about the homeland. We got to still be concerned about our families. We got to still be concerned about our loved ones. We got to still be concerned about our children. See, sometimes we get so religious that we forget about those that, that are connected with us. We need to give them the word. Even if they hear it or reject it, still give it to them anyway. We've done our part. Amen. He had to go back in the homeland and get the people. And the Bible said all the people had one thing in common. They all had the one mind. Their mind was to get the walls built. They wasn't going to let nothing make them get off those walls. They was not going to let nothing stop them from doing work. Amen. They had a lot of people like the, 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 uh, Tobiah and, and Samalot and all that trying to mock him and criticize him and, 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 and make them get off the walls. They said, we're not getting off the walls until the walls are finished. Amen. Oh, I just had to go there. Hallelujah. But we need to hear the true story. That's what's going to save us. Amen. Hosea 4 and 6 says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I would also reject thee. Amen. That thou shalt be no priest to me. In other words, we, we, we reject that knowledge. When we reject the understanding of God's word, the Lord said he reject us. You get people coming to church and, oh, I don't want to do all that, and they walk out. When they're getting ready to get a word from the Lord, you have just rejected the Lord. You ain't rejected that preacher. You rejected the Lord. The Lord said any man that reject knowledge has rejected me. Amen. And the Lord said that thou shalt be no priest to me. In other words, you're not going to ever carry my word. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I would also forget your children. So what that tells us, anytime we ignore that word, when that word is coming, we got, we got opportunity to receive that knowledge, and we reject the knowledge. The law said, you didn't just reject the knowledge, you rejected me. And the law said, I would also reject you, and you would not be no priest for me. And the Lord said, now when I reject you or forgot, forget you, I'm going to forget your children. See, I want the Lord to always be that concerned about my children. I want my children as they grow older, they can still be able to walk in the promises and the blessings of God because of the standard that I, that I, I served in the life that I've lived before him. Amen. Don't you know it's a many people that's in the Bible that you never find anything they've done very important and good, but because they was connected. To somebody that was good. Don't you know you read about Isaiah. Amen. I mean about Isaac. You read about Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. But you read about Isaac. You never see nothing Isaac did good. Isaac never done anything. The only thing Isaac had was a promise. Because of his father Abraham. As he went to the land of Gerar. The Lord says. You just go over there. It's a land that, that, that there's a poverty in the land. There's a famine in the land. But let me let you know something. Your father Abraham, he walked in my statutes. He walked in my ways. He walked in my commandments. And because you are his son, I'm going to bless you. The same thing with Solomon. You'll never find nothing great about Solomon. You know, all the wisdom and knowledge is good. But yet still, there was no relationship with the Lord. But because his father David was. The Lord said, what can I do for you, Solomon? Because of your father, David. He walked in my laws. He walked in my statutes. See, God will bless your children because of who you are in him. 
That's why I said, Lord, I want to have a relationship with you because the relationship that I carry with you carries on to my children and my children's children. They're going to be blessed because of the standard that I walk. Sometimes I may have a tendency to slip away a little bit. Sometimes I have a tendency to kind of not be all that we want them to be. But you train them up when they're young. And when they get old, they're coming back to it. I remember my mom and my daddy said that. And I remember they never had a hungry day. They never had a sick day. They, whatever sickness they even tried to come over them, the Lord delivered them. And I remember that. They always stood on the Lord. See, that's because you trained them. So many times we wonder why our children is not like what we think they should be. Why aren't they serving God like we think they should? But don't worry about it. See, they understand they got something. They understand they got something. They got a promise because of who we were. Because of who we were to the Lord. And because of the standard that we serve with the Lord. Because we build a relationship. You build it also for your children. And your children, children. Amen. But then also, if we are not serving the Lord, and we walk out of the statutes and the commandments of God, we bring a curse to our children and our children, children. Amen. All through the Bible. When men was evil and wicked, not only they went down into the pit, but also their children and their children, children went down. When Akin, you know, did what he did when he took the accursed thing, the Bible said not only was he destroyed, but everything that he possessed, everything he had went. Amen. We realize that when we serve God, God is going to serve us. God is going to serve our babies. God looks at our children. When he looked upon us, he looked at all our generations. Amen. I even think about even the beginning when even Abel, you know, was killed by his brother Cain. And after he killed his brother, he thought everything was over. But the Lord says, where is your brother? Cain, where is your brother? He said, am I not my brother's keeper? The Lord said, your brother's blood cried from the ground all of his children all of his grandchildren all his great grandchildren all their bloodline that bloodline has been killed because of you you kill all the promises for his children his children children and his children 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 you kill all the promises when you kill one man you kill all the seed and all the bloodline that follows to an individual and i said man but then the Lord is so merciful to, to Adam and Eve. The Lord said he permitted Eve to become pregnant again. And said because of that son that you lost, I'm giving you another son that you can bring seed to him. We bring and set to you. See, God is so good. Permit him to become, for her to be pregnant again. And we don't know how old these people was. Because David lived to be 960 years of age. 960. We don't know how it was when, when, when the children was born. We don't know how it was when that last child was born, when Seth was born. We don't know. Could have been four or 500 years old. As far as I'm concerned, he died at 960. So that means, you know, age was no time. Don't you know, time is shortened because of sin. Generations begin to die off earlier, you know, they live all ages. Methuselah lived to be, what, 969. The oldest man ever lived, Methuselah. He didn't live one day. One day is as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. He did not live one day. Close to it. 960 years, he lived, what, uh, uh, 31 years from being a one full day of living. But yet and still, eventually he died. And then what happened? From Methuselah, it began to diminish. Short, shorter, shorter, shorter. 700 years, uh, 600 years, 500 years, four, and then it got down to, and then it got to the fourth chapter, and they said, man, it's a little 120. Yeah, that was a, I got to look at that again. Just, just look at that for one second, y'all. Go, go with me to Genesis 4 chapter, just for one moment. Hey, man, I'm, I'm excited about this. Let me go to go to the sixth chapter. Sixth chapter. Let's go to the sixth chapter. Fourth chapter talks about Adam and Eve. But we want to go to the sixth chapter, the book of Genesis. Amen. Sixth chapter. Okay. 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 Sixth chapter. Go to the sixth chapter. And we're gonna look at uh 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 okay, go to verse three. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. For that he also is flesh, yet 
His days shall be 120 years. Nobody live past 120. 120, his days be. The Lord promised us 120 years. Some preachers say three, three, uh, three score, ten, by reason of strength. It be four score. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Lord said, yet, man, they should be 120. It's some people right now that are centurions. It's people right now that are 105, 110, 115 years old. But none got beyond the age of 120. That was a promise. 120. So somebody come tell you, man, you getting old. No, I ain't old. I'm still young. I don't care if I'm 80, 90 years old. I can go to 120 if the Lord say so. That's his promise. And I got it in the scripture. Man, they should be 120. Don't let nobody shorten you. They make you crush yourself. Oh, I think I'm going to live my time out. I'm getting old now. You're still young. Them old people you see 100 years old, they ain't telling you they're old. Well, I'm just gone. I'm just living good and living right, eating the right thing. And so I'm eating everything in the world. You know, but God is a good God. You're not leaving here until your work gets finished. Whatever God has deemed for you to do, you're going to do it. Amen. Amen. But we just want to kind of go there a little bit in case somebody try to go and start, try to shorten your life and tell you that you don't supposed to be here that long and all of that. We just want to, you know, but. A lot of people say things because they don't know knowledge, don't have knowledge. They don't know what the word says. Anytime somebody trying to tell you something contrary, don't argue with them, just give them the word. And when they come and try to tell you, yeah, yeah you know, but God is good, I understand that, but you know you didn't live your time. <clears throat> Genesis 6 and 3. What it says, yet man strives to be 120 years of age. The Lord gave a man. You know how old Moses was when he died? Guess what? 120 years old. Amen. Amen. Because that's what the Lord promised. Ain't nobody live beyond that period of time. Oh, you see all these people in the fourth chapter, in the fifth chapter, how long they live, long life. But then you go to the sixth chapter. The Lord said, repent me that I made man. I want to destroy my creation. But the Lord found favor with one man. And said, I'll build me one more word with one man. He, every man's days were shortened because of that. The Lord said, first, I'm going to do away with my creation. I'm going to destroy everything I made because of repenting me that I made, man. Because the sons of God ending mingling with the daughters of men. Because men are the, that I purpose to be the men of God, they ain't mingling with the, with, 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 with the daughters of men. And I'm going to destroy my creation. I'm going to destroy all creeping things, all, all beasts of the field, all birds. I'm going to destroy. The Lord is said, in other words, I'm getting a death sentence. Everything, everything going to have to die. Ain't nothing going to live eternally, no more. Don't you know man was put on earth to live eternally? God put man on earth. Earth is a replica of heaven. He said, let things be on earth as it is in heaven. He intended for, for man to be a king on earth. He intended for man to, to rule his creation. He intended for man to have dominion over the works of his hands. For he said, what in the, in, in, in the word of God, it said, for what is man that thou art mindful of him? For the son of man that thou visited him. For that man, my little Lord, and the angels, that crown of glory and honor, that have given him dominion on the works of thy hands. Thou put all things objection on their feet. All beasts of the field, birds of the affection of the sea, and they that dwell in the path of the sea thereof. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. What is man that thou mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visited him, that made him a little lower than the angels, that crowned him with glory and honor, that given him dominion on the works of thy hands, that put all things in subjection under his feet. Why? This is what was said. Why is man so vital? Don't you know God didn't even make angels in his image? He made man in his image? Did we even greater? Angels, because we're going to judge angels. Don't you know we're going to judge angels? Amen. The word of God says it. He'll sign angels. And some of us got some of the laziest angels in the world. We never put them to work. They're just so lazy. Sitting right there, you ain't going to use me. I'm going to just sit here and just sit down and just get fat. Some of us got some of the fattest angels. They never work. They're so lazy because we're not using them. You're supposed to send your angels out. You're supposed to do I send my angels out to go forth and, and bring the word of the Lord to the Lord that by his stripes I'm supposed to be healed. Your word said it, Lord. 
Send that angel out. Send them out. They ain't going nowhere. They ain't moving, and they don't move a butt by the word of God. Nothing else moves them except the word of God. You better know that word, or you got an angel sitting down there. Ain't going nowhere. You, an angel, go tell the Lord I'm hurting today. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that language. I've been in glory land all, them, all my life, and I've just been sent on earth to be your angel. And I don't know that language. The language they speak all day is the word of God. The, the language that they speak in heaven is the word of God. And when you speak in a natural language, God ain't moved by your, and by your emotions. He ain't moved by your feelings. Amen. You got to quote that word. You got to know that word to move them angels. Because all in heaven, that word, that word is in heaven. That same word that we get right here is also recorded in heaven. And we got authority. We got a treasure chest. And we got this word of God in our lives. We have a treasure chest. In that treasure chest, we got a lot of the treasure chest. The Lord said, I give you the keys of heaven. To whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever loose on earth should be loose in heaven. We got angels. And we also have a treasure chest, which is the word of God. And we got to know that if it's stored up in our treasure chest, we can get it out. Amen. Anything you put in that, you put that word of God in you, is is there. And when you get in trouble, you can put it out of there. But if you ain't got it in there, you can't get something out of something you ain't got in it. Amen. I can't get a word from the Lord out of something that I ain't got nothing in it. That's why we need that word. We need to get that word in us that we can store it in our. And our, that's why David said, the word have a hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You got to store it and make it accessible for you when you're in trouble. I know where to go when I'm getting in trouble. I go to the I go to the rock. I go to Jesus. And I go to the Lord. I say, Lord, your word says. I remind him what his word says. And he got to honor his word. The Lord is not man that he shall lie, not the son of man he shall repent. All his promises are yes and amen. You got to go to the word. Move some of them angels out of the way. Put them to work. Amen. Okay. So the Lord said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou rejected knowledge. I'll, I'll reject you. And thou hast no priest in me. Thou shalt be no priest in me or to me. Seeing that he rejected the law of God, I would also reject or forget thy children. Amen. Amen. And then he says in Isaiah 53 and 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. In other words, everybody doing their own thing. We like sheep just gone astray. Everybody have turned to their own way. Everybody's not following the way of God. We've gone astray. See, and we've gone astray even in the church. Everybody got their own thing. And some people got visions in the church, and there should be only one vision. Well, that ain't what I feel. That ain't the way I see it. I don't think the church should do that. I don't think. That's why the church is confused. Confusion in the church. Because everybody going their own way. Everybody doing their own thing. Don't you know, what would it be like if we didn't have a leader? Everybody be saying, I think we need to do it. I think we need that. We'd be number confused. We'd be like the people that, uh, you, you remember when the people was building the, uh, the Tower of Bethel? That they said, oh, we can do everything, but we can go and build a tower. And they was building it. They all got their minds together and say, we don't have to go through the Lord and we don't have to find God. We're going to make a tower and we're going to get to heaven the easy way. And they were doing it, but they were, they were all working together. And all the Lord said, wait a minute. If they do it this way, if I allow this, they won't need me. And, and they will accomplish it. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to confuse their language. Man, they got up there and they got to the top of there. And he tried to tell the guy below him, man, give me some more rocks. Give me some more bricks. Give me some more stone. He said, he's speaking another language. God said, I don't understand you. No complaint day. And then he's speaking French. He said, I'm trying to, I don't tell about Everybody got different languages. The Lord confused him. <laughs> Amen. Because if he wouldn't have, see, that's why we realize in the church should be one distinct voice. And the Lord should speak to his servant. When you got other voices speaking in that, it's confused the folk. You got people that sitting in that chewing gum. They hearing another voice. And that's why they all messed up. Amen. We need to realize we need to come to church. We all need to be focused on the voice of God. Speaking to the man of God. Don't you know God used just that one man? I know y'all get sick of hearing that. One man. 
to almost bring three million people to the promised land. One man named Moses. That's the only person God looked at. God looked, you look at Joshua and all the rest of them. He looked at one man. He spoke on one man. The Lord said, I put that one man in charge. That's the man I'm looking at. Everybody else, Lord, help us, Lord. I don't hear you. I'm looking at that man. All of a sudden, they realized Moses' hand went up. They're victorious. Moses' hand went down. They were defeated. Somebody said, we got, maybe we got to be sensible with this thing. God looking at this man. <laughs> Let's get this man on the Mars Hill. We need to put him high. Amen. One get on one side, one get on the other side. Lift this man up. They saw his hand going up. All the enemies. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Hezekites, the Philistines, they were all destroyed anytime Moses' hand went up. He was just so meek and humble and so present and so precious in the sight of God, God couldn't stop or watch him. He was the only man that can tell God, don't do it. Can you imagine you being so close, connected to the Lord, you would be in so great relationship with the Lord, you can tell the Lord, don't do it no more, Lord, stop it. Enough is enough. They're going to say, you brought them over here from Egypt and you couldn't deliver them through the, through the wilderness. Lord, stop it. And the Lord, okay, Moses, I'll do it for your sake. But they do it again, Moses. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to do something. Talking comes a relationship. See, your relationship can be so close to the Lord that you can stop the Lord in his tracks. Even when death is looking like it's coming your way, you got authority when you close connect to the Lord. Say, Lord, please stop it today. Don't let nobody else die. Don't let, no, don't let it happen to nobody else. And you can, because the relationship you have built with the Lord can be so great, the Lord will hearken to your voice. Amen. So we need to understand that we are servants of God. When we got a man or woman of God that has been placed in charge of us, the Lord calls them watchmen or see us. They're the people that can see things we can't see. They'll see us, S-E-E-R-S. They'll see us. What that mean? That mean they can see what we can't see. Because God's God of order. God don't work out order. He don't care if your hands jump up and hey, hold on a minute. I, this is what I think. The Lord said, I don't see that. It's confusion. On the one voice I'm hearing. Let me tell you something. It's so many mistakes I make. So many times I make a mistake. And the Lord is so precious. He'll permit my mistake to work out for good. And I go back to the Lord and say, Lord, thank you so much. You, you got me through this again. I put my foot in my mouth. I said, somebody said, had no business saying, I done something I had no business doing, but you bailed me out again. You know, the Lord will bail you out of your foolishness. You know, I always make that, but well, man, pastor said that, man, you know, and I thought he, I thought he would never say nothing like that. Well, I make mistakes. I'm human too. I got to go to the too. But the Lord is so precious. He'll permit my mistake to turn into a blessing. He said, that's my servant. Don't you know Moses made a lot of mistakes? But God kept saying, that's my servant Moses. That's my servant Moses. He said it, and I do. Mo Lord, stop it. You sending that plague? Stop it, Lord. And because Moses said it, the plague stopped. He heard Moses' voice. Listen to Moses' hands. Moses' hand went up, Lord, I need you right now. The Lord said, I see your hand, Moses. Don't you know even Hezekiah did it? When Hezekiah was told, the Lord, I'm about to destroy you, that get your house in order, you're about to die and not live, Hezekiah went to the wall. He began to pray and cry to the Lord. Lord, I removed the groves and I removed all the idols and, and I cleaned up your house and I got your house in order. And Isaiah went back and said, the Lord, I didn't told him, before like, you got to the middle of the court, turn back around. I've heard his prayer and I saw his tears. And go to Hezekiah. I'm going to add to him 50 more years. See, we can remind the Lord something and done something. You ain't got nothing to remind him about. It ain't no sense you crying out. Your work and your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord sees everything we do. Even if it's good or bad, the Lord judges you by your heart. See, if your heart is in the right place, we can make mistakes. Like I told my wife a lot of times, I say, don't something out of a heart can get us in trouble. You see people, you get compassion. Oh, I just want to help her. And that guy wound up, thank you so much, and go right to the liquor store. And you say, Lord, I try to do the right thing. The Lord say, your heart is in, 
you know, your heart is in the right place. You got a good heart, but you also got to have wisdom. You got to be wise. If you got a guy right here standing in front of the liquor store and you can smell the liquor on his breath, it don't take a rocket scientist to tell you that boy is drunk. Don't tell you, don't give him that because he's going to get it. Now, if you see a guy that looks like he's just a victim of circumstance, in the spirit of God, you say, Lord, should I give or should I not give? And the Lord says, give him. The Lord letting you know something. I remember one day was going over to an ice cream parlor right there. It used to be uh, Baskin Robbins right there in Gateway. I don't know if some of y'all remember Baskin Robbins. It used to be in Gateway Center. And uh, I had a daughter working over there at Baskin Robbins, and she would get off at 10 o'clock. And me and my wife would generally go there and pick her up and bring her back home. Well, one day, they had this Caucasian guy just walking back and forth, walking back and forth. All of a sudden, he came to the car. He said, sir, can you give me, can you give me a dollar? I hadn't eaten in three days. I said, hold on a minute. I gave him some money. I said, I'll give you this in the name of the Lord. He said, thank you very much. He said, because right now it was on my mind. I was getting ready. I said, if you wouldn't give me something, I was going to go get right over there off Gateway Bridge. And I was going to jump down and commit suicide. I said, Lord, I thank you that I heard your voice. You told me to give him. He thought that nobody loved him. See, sometimes we realize, you know, God used money sometimes as a sign of love. Sometimes money can really get you in trouble with God. Because the love of it is the root of all evil. The love of money. Don't tell, don't tell nobody. Pastor say, you put, don't put out no money. I ain't told you that. Don't go go ahead and tell nobody. I say the, the love of money. That means money got you. you. You ain't got money. Don't you know money can have you? Money can make you hate people. Money can make you do evil. Money can make you change. Position two. I'm going to tell y'all one of the one times about a position. You get some folks that wasn't nothing. All of a sudden, they get a, get a position. I saw a guy put on an orange cap one day and got on a white cap the next few days, and that guy got to be a beast. I said, where this guy came from? Me and him was out here talking crazy the other day. Me was out here, you know, finding ways to, to go over the job. And we were sleeping in, in, in corners when we put me out there working and all that. Me and him, was, now he's out here telling me, I better not fall asleep. See, that rascal knew all my hiding places. Because him and I was a few days before, we were doing the same thing. He come telling me, I tell you right now, now I'm, I'm a former now. I don't want you falling asleep on this job. I'm going to tell you right now, if I get you sleep, I'm going I'm to I'm 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 fire you. I said, man, man, you would, I don't care for me you were doing. I'm a former now. I said, okay. All right, man, I see where this is going. Let me get quiet with this guy. This guy got all the answers. Well, let me tell you, it wasn't but a few months later. He, they put a man, a man with him just like him to watch over him, roared him up. He wanted to get some time off. He lost that orange cap, that white cap. He got back to the orange cap again. <laughs> so sometimes stuff can set you up for a fall. <laughs> the Lord already know what we're going to do. Lord, I get a bunch of money. I'm going to pay my tithes. Church ain't going to need nothing. Everything they need, I'm going to give it to them. Boy, I, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm help build the church. You know you're lying like a dog. Put a few dollars in your hand, you left the church. We had one man, got rich, sitting right in this church. Man was on a, on a job, had one of his co-workers got killed right there next to him. And the guy was uh, working at his plant. And the guy went to the mental institution. I'll never forget that. I was going to the mental institution day by day to visit, visit, and visit, and praying with him, praying with him. All of a sudden, they told the guy, because of what you went through and all of that, we're going to watch it. They watched that guy's some millions. That guy wound up getting a brand new boat, got a brand new house, got a brand new car, Cadillac, wound up getting a whole bunch of stuff. You know the first thing he did? He left the church. He said, well, I'm out of here. Ain't gave the church a dime. Ain't told no, ain't gave nobody nothing. Just kept it to himself. He went there and he, guess what he did? He lived his fabulous life for a while. But then all of a sudden, all that stuff was lost. All was gone. Because anytime you don't do it in the right and cause, especially when you lie to God. See, when you lie to God is when you lie in God's house. If I, if, I'm, if I lie to God, that means when I lie to a man, a woman of God, I'm lying to God. 
if we are God's children, if you're going to lie to me, you just lie to God. Why? Because God is in me. God is in you. So if you lie to a brother or sister in the Lord, you just lie to the Lord. Especially if, if you quote the word of God. If you stand and you're supposed to be a child of God. And then we lie to God. Then the first thing we do, I'm out of here. Amen. I had a woman told me, I'm going to get a job. And if I get the job, I'm going to be a tither. She got the job. Pray with her right here in the church. My wife right here, she can test. Pray with her right here. Woman went back and got that job working at a fabulous plant. That's the last time we saw her. Ain't been back since. People think they can lie to God and they can come back and do it. I'm like, and that's a man. That ain't God. Well, you are a man of God. People lie to Moses. They lie to God. Moses was the one that went back there. They told Moses, you know, Moses, we don't have to listen to nothing. Listen to nothing you got to say. All of a sudden, the Lord plagues over to him. Some diseases that way. And guess what they did? Moses. 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 Can you please go to God? Tell God, stop sending these plagues. We're about to die. Moses being so meek and humble. Lord. Please stop the plagues. Okay, Moses, because of you, I do it. Okay, plague stop. Amen. Say, so I want to sit back and say, Moses ain't no good. Moses ain't what he needs to be. Let's go and do our own thing. Moses, sit back and humble, submissive before God, mild and meek. Pray for him. Got him blessed where the Lord stopped for what he purposed to do. Don't you know one of the greatest things you can have in your church is a powerful intercessor? You know what an intercessor must mean? An uh, intercessor is somebody that spent time with God. An uh, intercessor is somebody that got a relationship with God. That when a problem comes anywhere, that intercessor can go and they don't have to be seen before anybody. They can go and pray and the Lord will move in that situation. That's what intercessor. See, that was a time people went to Israel and told the Lord, Lord, are oh, there not anyone that can come? Is there not any bomb in Gilead? And the Lord said, are oh, there not any intercessors in the city? What? Go to your intercessors. Go to the innocent. Go to the intercessor. Are there not any intercessors in this city? People that are laboring before me. People that are fasting and supplicating before me. People that are knowing how to keep their mouth and their heart in conjunction with me. They are innocent. See, anybody can't be an intercessor. Abraham was an intercessor. Moses was an intercessor. Those are people that stopped plague, stopped sickness and diseases on people's lives. Amen. Abraham was the man that went back and, and stopped uh, Simon and Martha being totally destroyed and killing a lot. Oh, Lord, wait a minute. Hold on a minute, Lord. Lord, it's not going to go destroy it. Hold on a minute, Lord. Would you not destroy the unrighteous, the sinners with the righteous? The Lord says, what you mean, Moses? I mean, Abraham, if I find 50, would you save the sin? Abraham, I save 50. All the way down to 10. What? I say for 10 sake, Abraham, that was not 10. That was not a righteous man in the city. Lot was not righteous. He was, a, he was an alcoholic. But see, the Lord knew where Abraham was going with that thing. He knew. He wanted his nephew to be spared. The Lord said, I tell you what I'm doing. Angels go there to Lot's house and give him opportunity. And he didn't go in there and tell Lot, you just come with us. He said, okay, anybody that, that was willing to, 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 to get out of this city, and, 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 and believe the angels, follow the angels. And Lot followed, took his daughters with him. Son in law said, We ain't leaving. Wife said, I'm coming. But man, but I really don't want to go. She turned around. You know what that means? When, she, she, when they said that she turned around and turned to Pillar South, that means she didn't want to go. So many people, they, they love God. They say they love God, but they're not willing really to go all the way. They're not willing to turn away from some things. They're not willing to go all the way in the Lord. And see, and that's what he calls double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. See, we got too many double-minded people in the church. You're not willing to go all the way. You're not willing to, you know, you know, to pick up a cross. You're not willing to go through some things for Christ's sake. So you want everything to go your way. And if it don't go your way, you're ready to hit the highway. And we wonder why God is not blessing us like we thought he should. God know you. You can't fool God. The Lord looks at you and looks at your heart and look at your relationship and your commitment. See, we need to build a relationship and a commitment with the Lord. Lord, I'm committed to you. 
I want to be totally committed. The Lord said, you do? Okay. Are you willing to die the death that I die? Are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to take up a cross and fight after me? Are you willing to do that? See, anybody want to fight after the Lord when things are gone for, 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 for all the fish in the, in the loaves? But what about when the bad day comes? Are you still willing to follow? What about when somebody cuss you and call you everything but a child of God? Are you still willing to follow? And how about when somebody look at you and tell you you ain't nothing, you are no good, you're rotten, you're evil, you're, you're in the spit on you? Are you still willing to follow him? That's what you call relationship. That's what you call commitment. Everybody want to, they want to get close, but they don't want that relationship. They don't want to build that relationship with him. Relationship means just like what it says. Relation, relationship, son to father, father to son. That's relationship. See, the Lord wants us to have so great a relationship with him, just like our son should want to have with us as, as fathers, just like the daughters with their mothers or the, even the sons with their mama. That's a relationship where you know that I love you and I'm going to be there for you just like you've been there for me. Don't you know every son, when a son becomes a man, and his parents become older, he's supposed to take care of his parents. Oh, now the parents take care of the sons. The sons, see, we take care of the sons while they're young. But when we get old, they're supposed to take care of us. Amen. And the Bible said we're supposed to leave an inheritance from them. But you're supposed to still take care of them. Amen. That, that, that's God's standard. A parent will be taking care of a grown-up man all his life. He'll never grow up. You got to release him. And then he's got to remember the blessing when he received where it come from. Hey Amen. I'm going to remember my mom and my dad in their old days. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to make sure they have no need for nothing. Every parent, when you become a grandparent, you're supposed to have children. If they have it, they're supposed to be willing to look out for you. Make your life very comfortable because you made theirs. It's a lot of things my mama told us. She said, son, you don't realize what I for y'all. You don't realize how I went many days without things for y'all. And I remember all that. I remember sometimes she sat down there with me and she would sit down there and she would start talking to me and she would say, son, you know, a lot of times I went without things for y'all. I went without underwear. Sometimes to make sure y'all had underwear. I went without food to make sure y'all had food. I went without things that was vital for my life to make sure y'all had everything. I said, mama, I want to thank you for that. How many times have we sat back and told our mama, our daddy, uh, somebody that truly loved us and showed the love to us, how we appreciate them? But, you know, when a mama can sit back and tell you about what they did, and I remember what she went through. I remember the days that she went without to make sure I had. That's what a mama do. But then the same thing supposed to be with a child. When they get to be an adult, when mom and daddy get old and can't do for themselves, we're not supposed to go stick them to an old folk home. We're not supposed to sit down and let somebody take care of We're supposed to take care of them. You understand what I'm talking about? If my mama couldn't hardly get around, my mama was able to get around. Before she died, she wasn't where well, she couldn't get around. She would have been in a situation, couldn't get around. She was going to stay in my house. My wife said that. My wife said, daughter, can we get mama over here with us? I said, I don't think mama going to come. And I've even asked her for that. I said, mama, you want to come stay with us? No, son, I'm going to stay in this old house. I've been here all them years. I ain't going nowhere. God ain't going to take me nowhere. God going to let me be here. I'm going to be okay. That's where she stayed. Stayed in the house. Grandmother the same way. She died in the, you died in the house. She wasn't getting out of that house. You know, and the thing about our parents, they love their old abodes, their old homes so much, you wouldn't have died right in it. They didn't die, you know, they didn't die out there. They died in the houses. Grandma died in the house. Mama died in the house. My brother died in the house. You know, because this is what the allegiance was. This is where I'm going to be. But the, but, but the thing about it, they may have died in that house, but they had life in another house. Because our body houses another house. Amen. This is a house for the Holy Spirit. He lives in this house. We got to be careful what goes on in this house. Not only what goes into your natural home, but also in your spiritual house. Man, we got to be careful what goes in. The Lord said, any man that defiles my temple, him also I shall defile, said the Lord. Now the Lord said, if you mess over me and my body that dwell in you, I'm going to mess over you. He said, if you defile this temple, 
you also shall be defiled, said the Lord. You got to be very careful. You got to be very careful. Don't, don't eat no junk all the time. Ain't nothing wrong with, you know, in moderation. But don't eat stuff when you know it's not good for you. And think the Lord's going to prolong your life. You got to be careful. We got to eat stuff in moderation. I ain't never told the church, you can't eat pork chop. Pork chops are good. You can't eat all the time. High blood pressure. Amen. Cheese. Stuff like that. Bad for you. High cholesterol. White bread. White meat. Me, me, white uh, rice. Stuff like that. All your whites are bad. Eat brown rice. Eat, eat, you know, eat sweet potatoes. Stuff like that that's better for you. Eat the greens. Uh, vegetable, peas, mustards. You know, stuff like that. Those are better for you. You live a long time. Amen. I always wonder how did our parents live to eat some of the stuff they ate and live long lives. You know? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I mean, you know, I mean, I've seen, I've seen my parents eat some stuff, man. Eat them. And they say, y'all don't know, know about chilling. Chillings. Chillings and hog mog and all that. You know, all that. Okay, you going another way there, mother. Amen. <laughs> Talking about some of that I didn't want to mess with. Amen. But God is good. We got to be very careful. We got to protect these temples that God's given us. Amen. And they're only for just a little while. And then we have to give an account. Amen. Good Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for everything that's been said. We're asking that everything be said with season, with salt, that you be glorified in us, that you have your will and your way in our lives, and that we shall hold these things to heart, that we will protect this temple, that we will seek after knowledge, because you say he that has knowledge has also the blessings of God, because wisdom comes forth from knowledge, and we know wisdom comes from God. Father, we ask your name, you'll give us that knowledge and understanding of things that we can get that word and hide in our heart that we may not sin against you, that we can have it as a treasure chest, that when sickness or disease come, we can go forth and grab that word to help us, to heal and deliver us, permit us to have preventive measurements within our lives, that we be able to go for a pre preventive maintenance to do all the things and protect the things that you purpose us to protect for our lives, to keep us able to fulfill, fulfill your mission on our lives. And we decree by faith and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're going to pick up an offer.